then I had to get my son quickly and then head home. So okay. I'm a little, little disheveled. So my apologies. <laughs> All right, uh, we are live now. Hello, everyone. I'm Monjima Sharkar, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology curated under TM Bias Review in association with Oxford University Press. Under this theme, TM Bias Review December 2022 will explore the role of artistic endeavors of society in shaping cultural identity and ideology. I would also like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems. And for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Today's topic of discussion is an exploration of our art experience in social networking spaces. We are honored to have with us Dr. Saurav Banerjee, Dr. Ritu Bernaroy, and Dr. Bradley E. Wiggins as our esteemed speakers for the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. We shall now quickly introduce our speakers. Dr. Saurav Banerjee is an associate professor and HOD of a government-sponsored college affiliated to University of Calcutta. He is an education ambassador of IOER Philippines, a member of the International Advisory Board of Post-Humanities and Citizenship Futures, an international editorial board member of APJAET, book review editor of Journal of Ecohumanism, reviewer of South Asia, Journal of South Asian Studies, and also a reviewer of Intersections. He is writing a book on David Maduf and has conducted interviews of many academic stalwarts. Now let me introduce our second speaker. Dr. Ritu Bona Roy is an academic and writer an alumna of Presidency College and Calcutta University. She has taught at several institutions in Kolkata, Leiden, and The Hague. She is the author of South Asian partition fiction in English, from Kushwan Singh to Amitav Ghosh, Amsterdam University Press 2010, and co-editor of the ICAS volume, Writing India Anew, Indian English <coughs> Fiction 2000-2010. She is the initiator of the Kolkata Partition Museum project that aims at the establishment of a partition museum in Kolkata. Dr. Roy blogs and writes features and reviews for online portals and magazines. Her maiden collection of shots, Goria Hart Junction, was published in 2020 by Kitab International, Singapore. She is currently working on a memoir and a co-edited volume of essays on the Bengal partition. Now, let me take the opportunity to introduce our third and final speaker for today's panel. Bradley E. Wiggins, PhD, is an associate professor and head of the Department of Communications at Webster University's Vienna campus. His research interests include internet memes, digital culture, and intercultural simulations and games. His scholarship has been published in competitive journals such as Simulation and Gaming, New Media and Society, Social Semiotics and International Journal of Communication. His monograph, The Discursive Power of Memes in Digital Culture, was published by Routledge in 2019 and reissued in paperback in 2020. Now, without further delay, we shall start with today's session. Dr. Banerjee, I request you to please present your views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Manjima, for the wonderful introduction and for uh, inviting me to this panel. I mean, uh, I'm really honored to be in other company. Uh, and so I'll begin. So uh, the, the title of this is an exploration of our art experience in social networking spaces. And uh, I, I, I'll, I'll begin by saying that we live in a postmodern world of virtual realities and the metaverse. And, and now we exist in a parallel world simultaneously. Uh, while I am sleeping in the real world, uh, somebody is perhaps watching an avatar of me delivering a talk on YouTube, while another person may be viewing a, a Facebook live post of mine. Now, under such circumstances, it is but obvious that all our uh, experiences will undergo a sea change, and I, I believe art is no exception. And when we uh, refer to art, we actually delve into the realm of culture. 
Now, uh, if you recall, all the leading critics of culture, like Lord Hopkins, Raymond Williams, and Terry Eagleton, have pointed out that there are two kinds of culture, uh, and they are very different from each other. Culture as art, and culture as a way of life. Now, uh, let me say that Terry Eagleton also feels that culture uh, may appear superfluous at times, and even though it seems innocuous, it is. also divisive what i mean to say is that the very fact that it involves <coughs> habitual and well etched out procedures and it also necessitates the exclusion of others somebody uh, somebody is in and somebody is out so that way now uh, for from what i have said so far there is no doubt that art to us in the modern age and it is vocally means a body of artistic and intellectual work and not a whole way of life now uh, coming to understanding social networking spaces we can say that a social networking service or sns sometimes also called a uh, social networking site is a web based service or online platform which people use to build social networks or social relationships with other people who share a similar personal or career content interest activities backgrounds or real life connections the most popular social networking sites include facebook instagram and twitter now almost every aspect of our lives is now being dictated by social media uh, we look to the omnipresent all seeing forces of instagram facebook and twitter to communicate keep up with the world schedule our events uh, satisfy our most materialistic needs or even quench our thirst for activism and the list goes on so i will stop here but the essence is that the values of our world uh, seem to have changed from decades i think therefore i am to i am seen of course on social media and therefore i am it is therefore only natural for us in its uh, ceaseless ability to both reflect and influence its host culture to be entwined in the ever growing web of social media uh but the relationship between these two worlds is like any uh, enriching yet troublesome at the time at, at the same time now while social media has the ability to liberate and foster art to a prodigious extent it also raises queries about censorship or design and uh, uh and it blurs the distinction between art and those categories of creation that aspire to become art so uh, the issue of the social sharing of art is also a very pertinent one with the rise of the art selfie hovering between narcissism and promotion when visiting any place of interest nowadays it is very mundane to observe viewers walking past the art work phone in hand ready to promptly snap with the appropriate i mean promptly snap and post with the appropriate hashtag looking at the art itself through the screen or lens of their device rather than directly with their own eyes but the question that i want to ask is is this longing for the perfect instagram post or story standing in the way of a candid experience and genuine appreciation of the art or is it a sign of a different kind of engagement with the world now in this context uh, i would like to mention the superstar not only of the art world but also in the sphere of social media ya oi Kutama. So, if I, I'll, I'll try to uh, share a uh, slide. So, if I can uh, just share my slide, let me check. So, uh, yeah. Uh, can my slides be shared? Uh, are they on screen? uh so not yet yes now your slide is okay yeah yeah so uh okay i had started okay anyhow so she is without a doubt instagram's favorite artist with millions of people uh, photographing themselves immersed in a whimsical mirrored infinity room often having to queue for hours before entering uh, the gleaming utopia for a mere minute or maybe even less uh just enough time to capture the perfect hashtag selfie 
<coughs> her installations are all over Instagram, leading us to wonder if the experience is still about art, or is it just another way to cultivate the vanity of the spectator and their overwhelming desire to fit into the practice or practices cultivated and endorsed by the social media. But as Utama's exhibitions have taken over Instagram a feed of a new generation of art lovers, a, a more positive aspect includes the inclusion of idiosyncratic ideas and aesthetics like these within the mainstream. Like Utama's, the works of many Instagram famous artists tend to share a few traits. Uh, for one, they are highly immersive, a bit fantastical and escapist, and make for good selfies. Now, you can add brownie points to it if there is an added interactivity uh, with them. Now, positioning the viewer as both a willing subject and a voyeur, the socially optimized space resonates as a surreal form of the 21st century pop art, tapped into the currency of images and the onlookers desire to be culturally relevant. And now I'll move on to the next part of the talk that is not only our experience, art experience, but Social media is now redefining even how the art world does business. So I can say that in the past few years, over 70% of all Generation Y art buyers bought fine art online, with almost half of online buy uh, buyers using Instagram for art-related purposes. And I'm saying this on the authority of Gotham Magazine. So from making sales easier to site-setting galleries, social networking sites are making a big statement and I will underline or I'll just outline a few of the prominent ones. First is that the artist can now go directly to the audience. Never before this had an artist the power to get into a conversation directly with the audience uh, before the advent of Facebook and Instagram. And, and frankly speaking, I don't see this changing anytime soon. Now, curbing traditional means of uh, communication, social media allows an artist to speak with their followers about who they are and what they are creating. Some, uh, someone can inquire about a piece and in an instant, viola is sold. And with one faithful follow, the respected eyes in the industry can consider someone's work on a daily basis. <coughs> now, uh, to prove, uh, I will move on to the next slide. So uh, the case in point is that the emerging artist, VP Laval, and, and uh, the next one, Jimmy uh, Pigasus post, they were posting their art on Instagram when Richard Prince took notice and went on to help them launch their careers, land exhibitions, and much more. Another example is that of one minute artist, Dan Lamb, who was teaching at a community college and the next minute she was sending a piece to Miley Cyrus and being featured at art business. Okay, the second point that I was going to talk about is that the social media boom has ensured that the artists no longer have to rely solely on galleries and the art world elite to validate their success. Instead, the masses following his or her social media accounts are proof enough of their acceptance. Uh, even even uh, Vogue magazine acknowledges that today artists use Instagram as their own virtual art gallery, playing both dealer and curator, while their fans become critics and collectors. So in other words, while gallery representation is still prestigious, uh, it is no longer necessary to go through this middleman. The third point, as expected, is sidestepping the galleries and dealers by using social media also means that artists don't lose any money on galleries and or agents taking commissions. The fourth is that gone are the days when artists were forced to hobnob with critics and collectors and make their way into shows before being able to sell even a single piece. Uh, while I'm not, I'm not denying that while they still need to go out and talk to potential buyers, what I'm contending is that artists can do so without, I mean, artists can do so knowing full well that it is only one aspect of the art world and not the only way any longer. The fifth and the final point is that, that artists no longer have to fret when it comes to financing their dreams art projects. And all thanks to social media. With eager Facebook and Twitter followers at the ready, uh, an artist is able to share a link to his or her page and instantly receive donations from enthusiastic parents and strangers alike. Social media gives fundraising, crowd fundraising, a whole new meaning and spreads the word like wildfire. But uh, there is only one flip side to it. Uh, that flip side is that on social media, many artists 
have concerns about the privacy of their images or creation a download or perhaps a screenshot of his or her work could be passed around so many times that the artist's name and credit for the work may get lost in the transit but even then i mean I, i would say that this is not a big issue it can be addressed by adding a watermark to the work with apps like quick or canva which are basically free uh, and now since i'm talking about the uh, art on social media i'd like to talk a little about a particular social media art form called uh, nft now nft non fungible tokens or nfts as they are popularly known are cryptographic assets on a blockchain with unique identification code and metadata that distinguish them from each other now nfts can really be anything digital such as drawing music or anything else turned into an ai that is artificial intelligence now uh, the clip that i'm showing you it, in january 2022 a clip from the tonight show featuring jimmy fallon hosting paris hilton went viral not because either of them had said anything particularly interesting or scandalous but because the interview was so uncanny in its content and its style in the video hilton who looks like a telegenic radioactive barbie as you can see in a lime green cocktail dress is discussing board ap nft the popular crypto images that have been selling for a minimum of 200000 dollars since their first release in april 2021 now hilton as it happens is not the only quintessentially millennial cultural icon to have embraced the nft even if she might be the only one who describes them as having an i quote literally taken over my entire mind and soul now uh, lindsay lohan who once advised the readers of interview magazine on how to get filthy rich on nft has worked with a collective called canine cartel to release a much mocked persona a persona nft that depicted her as a sultry cartoon bull then uh, then we have uh, this is not uh, this Yes. Then we have Venet Paltrow. She has revealed that she has acquired a board of NFT. It's blonde hair and uh, Breton shirt, selected to reflect her subtle face. Then uh, the, the previous image was of uh, excuse me. The uh, the, pre, uh, the previous image was, was as I was talking of. Uh, I, I, I've lost it. Just give me just give me a minute. Of Lindsay Lohan. This I missed. And so this is. Gwyneth Paltrow, and then uh, how can we miss Eminem? Now Eminem never wants to miss an opportunity. Of course, bought a so-called Emin Eight. So it was named Emin Eight, and he paid a whopping four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for it, accessorized with a gold chain necklace and a khaki army cap, very similar to the one he wears in real life. Even Kevin Hart has bought a board monkey NFT. the most popular nft feature a single figure on a colorful background that is a usp uh the board if uh, as you can see nft is also is the same humanoid ape wearing a variety of accessories and disguises the lazy lion uh, do the same thing but with lion but, but the upside of many nfts having a uniform visual style is that theoretically as many of the medium's biggest fans will say says there is something inherently democratic about their design and their acquisition even if not every nft creator makes the kind of money board ape yacht club makes they still have a fairly equal opportunity to share their work uh, searching open sea for pieces is still easier by far than buying physical work from a gallery or from an auction and the only barrier to entry is a working knowledge of online medium just because the most popular nfts tend to be simple bright cartoonish and produced in enormous variable sequences does not of course mean that this is the only form of nft that can be minted it is possible for instance to make one slide of a video and i'm wondering when it will be done now if we go back to that slide that you are talking about uh, talking of the very eerie segment of the hilton and salon uh, conversing with recent enthusiasm about moon pay and board ape we uh, wonder I, mean, i i really wonder if anyone had yet been tech savvy enough 
to convert this particular video clip into an NFT. That would be the future, I would say. The flatly artificial lighting, a TV lighting that is, and the tilted dialogue both give the scene an unreal, almost hallucinatory quality, as we can see, see from here. Uh, as in some of the CGI pop culture uh, collages minted by the artist people, who once released an eye-popping NFT of an absurdly uh, muscular Elon Musk in front of an exploding rocket, we are seeing familiar singers in a disconcerting, unfamiliar context. And uh, as a historical artifact, the interview also ably captures a very specific time in art history. Uh, at the end of the video, Hilton tells the audience that she is giving each of them an NFT. And uh, Fallon says that this must be the first NFT giveaway in television history. Hilton smiles and says, I caught it. And it is in accordance with the loosey goosey hyperbolic modern usage of the word one can apply to a TikTok or a JPEG of an ape as easily as it can apply to a work uh, by, say, John Mitchell Bastier. Uh, this is the warrior by him. And, uh, and Paris, uh, that is Paris Hilton, may be right and she may be very prophetic. That is what maybe the future is holding for us in as far as appreciation or uh, art in social media is concerned. And with that, uh, I, I end my uh, talk here. Maybe I'll take up more issues when they come up in the question and answer session. I hope I'll be able to do justice to the topic. Thank you, sir, uh, for such an interesting presentation. And uh, you helped us recognize and appreciate the contemporary art scene across uh, several social networking spaces. And what is more interesting is how these artists have uh, successfully monetized their work. On that note, uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Rituparna Roy uh, to share her views on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good evening. Thank you, TMYS, for inviting me. Uh, Coral knows this. I'm here mostly to listen to Professor Wiggins and Shoro. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm very well equipped to talk on this topic, but what I'll do is my approach is not theoretical at all. I'll just share our experience uh, with social media. So the topic is an exploration of our art experience in social networking spaces. That, for me, and the organization that I represent, <coughs> the Kolkata Partition Museum project and the trust that steers it, uh, would roughly translate basically into uh, you know, an exploration of our journey, uh, for your journey in social networking spaces, because art is at the very heart of our endeavor, if I may say so. So I'm initiator of this museum project. I initiated sometime early 2016, but uh, in a formal way, uh, it started in August 2018 when the trust that steers the project was registered as an NGO. I'm also, I also happen to be the managing trustee of that trust. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what happened is just a year into our existence, the pandemic happened. And I will, I will say in, in a while, I'll, in a bit, I'll say what that did to us. But before that, just wanted to say, uh, uh, it was already said that, uh, you know, the main... Uh, purpose of this project is to uh, establish, it aims at establishing a partition museum in Kolkata, focusing on the Bengal experience, only on the Bengal experience, because Punjab has had a lot of focus till now. And it's time that Bengal got that attention that it uh, richly deserves. Uh, now, there are two emphases of the project. One is historical specificity. The other is cultural continuity. So since we are a museum project, obviously the most obvious purpose would be to memorialize the past. Uh, you know, this, this defining event of the 20th century that we had, which, and its aftermath and afterlives. So we want to memorialize the specificity of Bengal's experience of partition, its aftermath and afterlives in the most comprehensive manner possible. But even as we do that, we also have another agenda which we think is as important as the first one, which is to emphasize the cultural continuity between West Bengal and Bangladesh. You see, uh, West Bengal is a federal state within India and Bangladesh, which was like 
initially East Pakistan and then became Bangladesh. Now they have had very different political trajectories post as as post colonial entities. But despite that, uh, there has been commonalities, and because of the deeply divisive times that we live in, uh, we tend to forget that. So part of our aim is also to change the discourse of partition. So partition. The discourse of partition has been primarily about rupture, about violence, forced migration, trauma, intergenerational trauma. And for more than seven decades, that has been the focus, and understandably so, because you know, rupture was the most defining feature of the event and its aftermath. But seven and a half decades down the line, it is important that we look at partition in other ways as well. And the second emphasis that we have tries to do that. And when we talk of cultural continuity, what, what exactly do we mean? We mean that what is called living heritage. You know, we have a common living heritage in terms of language, literature, food, fabric, the performative arts, which is not a small thing. So uh, we also believe in the importance of the arts and preserving cultural memory, which is why uh, in all our major physical events, as well as most of our online events, you know, we have been preoccupied with art in some form or the other. So I just before our before I go into our experience, art experience in social networking spaces, I would just briefly like to talk about, you know, uh, the events that we've had, the work we've done so far. So as I was saying that just a year into our existence, the pandemic happened and we were forced into a digital mode. Like we had started with a big event and we were planning others. And our initial plan was to rent a space in an existing museum. Like all big museums start somewhere else, you see. Uh, so if, uh, we thought we would rent a space in an existing museum and ha have all our events there. And then we'll try and see how we proceed from there. But ultimately what panned out was we had events at different places, which is, which is actually, a, in a way, a more interesting and better model to work with. And we are a citizen initiative, so we are small, our resources are not a lot. Uh, we are growing organically. So it's still some time before we can afford to have a space of our own. Um, and, you know, basically do everything that a physical museum does. But we, we, what we originally thought the path towards it would be was totally changed by the pandemic. Uh, so the first event that we had was a four day film fest which included obviously audio audiovisual medium, uh, a, a tremendous art form. Uh, and, uh, you know, whenever in Bengal, whenever we, uh, whenever you think of partition uh, film to do with Bengal, the first name that comes up, and for many, the only name that comes up is Ritvik Khatto. Uh, but actually there have been many more, especially in recent years. So we did a one of kind film fest in 2019 uh, a four-day uh, fest where we included features and documentaries from both sides of the border. And we had Bangladeshi filmmakers, Tanvir Mukabmal and Akram Khan as our chief guests. One also did a masterclass with us. In this next year, we wanted in 2020, we were planning to do an art exhibition, which was again a unique art exhibition in the sense that, you know, we are not very conversant with partition art from Bengal. So Bengal has very famous and very uh, rich art to do with the famine the 1943 famine. And there has been art uh, centered around 1947, but not many people know that contemporary artists also have engaged a lot with partition. And uh, uh, art historian turned curator, uh, Rajashri Mukhopadhyay, unfortunately she left very, very soon. Uh, she had conceived of an art exhibition, a group show, uh, which was basically five contemporary artists and their take on partition. And we were planning to do it uh, at KCC, Kota the Center for Creativity in 2020. But, uh, you know, we could not because of the pandemic. So in lieu of an exhibition, we did a webinar with the participating artists where they shared some of their work and they had a discussion. And uh, the actual exhibition, the physical exhibition, we managed to do in 2021 at the height of the second wave in India, actually. Uh, so and the third, so like August is the, re is the, is the commemorative month really of partisans So usually uh, plan a big event in August. Uh, so after the film fest and the art exhibition this year, um, uh, we launched a virtual museum. Actually, we uh, the the more correct way to put it would be we announced the virtual museum because the link we haven't shared yet because our work is not yet complete and we will 
share the link later in the year in a, in a, in a month or two. Uh, but uh, we are like, it is basically a collaboration between two organizations, uh, the Kolkata Pantashi Museum Trust and an architecture firm, uh, Architecture Urbanism Research, headed by an Indian uh, based in the US. So it's a collaboration of the two and a 14 member team worked on it. So we did a team presentation at ICCR Kolkata. Uh, and virtual museum, you know, as you know, it also incorporates a wide range of media and art forms. So these has been the main uh, events uh, which have all revolved around art. But the online events too have had to do with art. So every year, every year we try to introduce something new. So since August is more or less about rupture in a way, you know. We thought that April, uh, which is the time of the Bengali New Year, uh, would be a good time to celebrate the commonalities. So we've had uh, a, a folk concert last year. We had a dance program this year. And uh, we also had two very special online programs last year uh, to celebrate two special days. One is Children's Day, which, is, which honors uh, uh, the great freedom fighter and the first prime minister of independent India, Jawaharlal Nehru, who was known for his love for children. 14 November is birthday and it's celebrated in India as Children's Day. So that day we had a book discussion, which is all about a book which collates the art of children living in border districts, uh, studying in border schools, what the border means to them. So here again, art and children's art. And last year was uh, the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh War of Independence. Now we are trying to memorialize the three partitions of Bengal. Bengal was partitioned thrice, not just 1947. The original one was 1905, which was, uh, you know, recited. Uh, then, then, then came 1947, and the Bangladesh War of Independence can be considered a third. So, uh, the, the 50th anniversary of the Liberation War, Vijay Dibosh, is also something that we celebrated through the films of one particular filmmaker who has been engaged with it with this topic. Who has been obsessed with it throughout? Like he's had seven films, including features and documentaries, and we, uh, you know, we we ce celebrated it through that. So what I am trying to emphasize here is that you know our preoccupation, though we are, it's a museum project considered to be a history project, it's a cultural project, but yes, but our emphasis on the arts is uh, uh, is new, like uh, you know the importance of the arts in preserving cultural memory, as I said. So what has happened in social, uh, in terms of our experience or our uh, art experience of basically our journey, because so much of it has had to do with art, uh, that experience in social network spaces, I think I would like to share three, four uh, unique aspects, if not unique, at least worth uh, discussing, uh, three, four aspects about our art experience in social networking spaces. So the first was that, uh, unlike many other organizations, we had a digital presence right from the beginning. So even before we had a first major event, in February 20, 2019, we actually announced ourselves as an organization at Jodhanan Prabhupada Kolkata. And in the same month, we, you know, our, fa our Facebook and website went live. And the reason why we did that was usually what happens, you will see any news in the world uh, the well-known ones, big, small, whatever. If every museum has an online presence, and this is now nothing to do with the pandemic. This is like a, a lot from a lot uh, earlier, at least 10, 15 to 20 years earlier, if not, if not more. I am aware of it at least from 2006 because I was in Europe for, for about a decade. Uh, and I, I know that. So uh, most museums do have an online presence. And that doesn't stop people from going and visiting the museums. And a lot of their content is already shared. Uh, so you see what happens is with established museums or established cultural organizations, what they do with their social media is that they, you know, it is it is both sharing about what the ongoing projects or what they will do, what they will uh, exhibit, etc. But it is also about, it's a kind of, you know, um, it's a way of uh, sharing what place they have reached in terms of collections, in terms of many other things. So for us, the social media platforms uh, that we started with immediately was really, it was not about what we have achieved because we had only started, but it was about where we were going. So we wanted our journey, our work in progress to be reflected uh, because we, you know, we want, I said we have two 
two uh, basically aims, uh, uh, historical specificity and cultural continuity. But there is also another one, which is we want to engage with the wider public, the general public, and we want to make knowledge about the partition uh, available and accessible. So, you know, to democratize that knowledge, to, uh, you know, to share it with the widest possible public uh, is also one of, uh, it is in fact integrated into whatever we do. So we also wanted people to know how we are going as we go along. Uh, so, so that has been there. And thankfully, I, mean, I, I think that, you know, it was good that we took that decision of having it right from the start. Because, and we included some, apart from the basic information, for example, in the website, we also included certain interactive features. Uh, and over the years, it is the Facebook actually, with, so there are so many, there is Facebook, there is Insta, there is Twitter, um, and each platform has its own unique advantages. Uh, over the years, the Facebook page became uh, the most active of our, of, of our handles. Uh, what happened at uh, the second, uh, good, that, uh, good that we started off right at the beginning with, with the digital presence, because as I said, the pandemic happened within a year and we were forced into a digital mode. So, you know, uh, so it actually helped us that way, that we had already uh, something in place with which we could do. So, which is why we did a number of online events. Uh, and it happened both ways. We uh, we organized, others also invited us. For example, I was invited to a number of uh, online events. Uh, so that also kind of spread the word about KPM. There are two other aspects, three, but I think two of them are like uh, part of the same uh, uh, year, I would say, is that, you know, while, so obviously in, Insta, uh, in the social media handles, what you do is, uh, the, the, for, for cultural organizations, a lot of it is event-based. So you announce events, what is about to happen. Um, and then, of course, post-event uh, posts also follow. Uh, for us, one of the things that we uh, very consciously concentrated on were certain warm-up posts before the events. For example, when we were having the fest, we did separate individual posts for each of the 12 films which were shown. Uh, when the art exhibition happened, we did separate posts for the artists and their chief preoccupations. When the VKPM was launched, we did we did separate profiles for all the team members. So, you know, these warm-up exercises, what we saw is uh, actually uh, these posts got a lot more engagements than uh, the event announcement. So, so we felt that, you know, people, so it was actually reaching out to a wider public, which is what we wanted. And uh, so art organizations or cultural organizations, you know, obviously, uh, hypothetically, it will be it will be geared up for the art community, for art practitioners. But as I said, that we obviously our agenda is wider. So uh, so disseminating this kind of information, uh, we thought would help and it did. And one of the most rewarding experience of of the social media engagement was you know, during the art exhibition. So what happened is obviously, it happened in the fest also. I remember a first year college student, undergrad student had given a wonderful post about, she had seen one of uh, a major documentary and she was so moved by that, that uh, she actually wrote a long post, public post about what it has done to her and how it had expanded her horizon about partition films. Uh, but it is the art exhibition where we saw that you know, audiences responded to it in a wholly different way. So partition art, as I said, you know, not many people know much about at least contemporary responses to partition in art. And what happened is it, it the art exhibition was received very well, uh, not just by the artistic community, but also uh, by the broader public. And uh, over the 12 days, what happened is there were not only media reports, uh, there were also citizen testimonials, right, from students to very elderly citizens who have known the partition experience themselves, to teachers, to people from different walks of life. They actually put up detailed posts and very moving posts, not just with pictures, but a lot of text. And we did a series of that. So till date, I think that the, the citizen testimonials for the art exhibition last year has been one of the most rewarding and I would say successful uh, art experience uh, in in social networking spaces for us. This year, 
we launched the VKPM, but of course the link, you know, we, we, we basically announced. So it is once we properly launch it, once it's out there in the world, people can access it. Then we will know exactly how they are responding to it. But art here again, so we uh, three main features of um, of the VKPN is uh, one is event gallery. Event gallery is you know we are trying to tell the we are trying to we are trying to share the story of partition through certain key events, key years uh, uh, through which you can say the partition story could be told. And uh, we have an independent oral history project, and we also have a virtual art gallery. Uh, where we are showcasing uh, work across generations on the theme of partition and related to it. Uh, the other experience that I want to talk about is that just this year in June, you know, our Facebook page was hacked. And uh, talking of social networking spaces, you know, this is one thing that uh, we all need to be very careful about. Uh, we thought we were, but despite that, it happened and it was a major setback because, as I told you, uh, the Facebook page was the most active of our handles and of course we cannot we cannot reproduce three and a half years of content in a jiffy uh, a lot of the content has been saved like you know it was it's there it can be reproduced but certain things cannot be replicated for example real-time comments those cannot be replicated uh, and obviously it'll take some time for us to we have thought of doing throwbacks uh, you know, uh, do, uh, some major uh, posts uh, to share as throwbacks. So this has been one of the negative experiences of social media. And uh, Facebook, actually, the Facebook help uh, center does not help at all. I'm very sorry to say. I'm saying this in public. Uh, so what we did was after several weeks of not being able to solve the problem, we started a new page. And once again, it's doing well, given that it's so new. Uh, but it'll have to grow. So I would say that has been, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how I've covered the topic, but it's really been, it's it's really about our journey. And one thing I would like to say is that one common thing that all social media platforms at least uh, is supposed to do, I don't know how much it actually does, is supposed to do is democratize information and knowledge. And obviously reach out to a wider public. So I'm hoping that at least we will be able to do that. We have been doing that. And I just hope, especially with the virtual museum, uh, we'll be able to do that even more. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your fantastic journey with the Kolkata Partition Museum project and articulating your views uh, on the discourse of partitions with, with such great precision. Uh, and now I would like to take the opportunity to request uh, Dr. Wittens to share his views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah just fine. Um, I had asked before uh, I put in the private chat if, if um, one could add the questions that were originally posted to or given to me for me to respond to. Um, perhaps you could, could do that, because I want to respond to the questions that you sent me. Uh, one by one. Um, so the first question that you asked me was about, oh, I see, I've got a note here during the Q&A section. I see. Okay. The first question was, um, one of my research papers has explored the, the discursive powers of, of memes and digital culture. And they asked me, how far do I think a dialogue regarding any contemporary social or um, political issue can be generated through memes? And it's it's a good question, but the, the, the thing is, it's not so much about whether or not the platform can allow it or um, whether the algorithms, I mean, all of the different attributes of a given social media platform are, are of course important, but even before you get to the question of which one are you talking about, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, or whatever, it, it, unless the network itself that has that shares the concern, similar to like a, a public, the public that is concerned about the issue that wants to initiate, extend, continue, et cetera, a dialogue or, or counter a dialogue, there have to be strong ties within that network. 
if there aren't strong ties, then it's probably not going to maintain itself. That's one, um, I think, critical lesson from social media is that it's really good at getting people triggered, motivated to, to do something, to flash mob, to do it initially, but it's terrible at maintaining it over time. It's really pretty awful at that. Um, one, two quick examples of what I'm talking about is uh, back in 1989, you had the so-called Monday demonstrations in former East Germany. This was before the Berlin Wall fell, but it arguably led to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, you're talking about individuals who mostly did not even have a telephone at home because the state controlled uh, such things like a telephone. Only approximately eight or nine percent of the population had telephones at home. Uh, so, and yet, even though they didn't have the internet, they did, didn't even have phones, they had strong ties, strong network, network based ties that, that uh, enabled um, a movement to emerge. Uh, moving forward to 2017, after the inauguration of Donald Trump, um, there was the Women's March. I participated in the Women's March in Vienna. It was quite something it was a there was something in the air so to speak it felt energetic it felt electric and so on but over time it sort of fades away there was an, a second women's march in um january of 2018 and i think maybe also in 2019 but it it wasn't it didn't have the same impact the same magnitude the same gravitas as the initial one and one could also look at the current uh, situation in ukraine where you have the war that started on, on um, February 23rd of this year, there was immense attention given to it. And there were memes, and there still are memes. And, and in fact, as a, as a side note, the uh, official account of, the, of, of, the, uh, of Ukraine on Twitter post, <laughs> regularly posts, um, excuse me, sorry, regularly posts uh, memes that uh mock that criticize russia that it, it, it really positions itself quite defiantly but the point is all of these things can last probably only for a short period of time there's also the the question of where else am i putting my attention uh it's um like TikTok, for example uh it, it's like a more perfected form of netflix where on Netflix, you have to choose what you want to watch, make a decision, think about, do I want to invest this time into it? Not so on TikTok. You just have to open it up, open the app and you can scroll and you don't even have to think about what you want to watch. Of course, over time, your viewing habits will direct or guide the content that you receive. But you see, it's, it's this massive draw on attention that is um, a more important thing, I think, to think about with regard to this first question about uh, how I think a dialogue regarding any contemporary social issue can be generated through memes. Now, that said, I want to say that, uh, of course, with all memes in general, there's always the consideration of humor. Now, even the most offensive, the most racist meme, I, of course, will not find humorous, but my, my what I'm saying is someone out there probably would. There's, there's always some, uh, even the most, the, the safest, silliest sort of a cat meme or something like this, even those, of course, also must contain humor, but there is usually something else going on in the meme, or at least those are the ones that I, I do the research on. A meme that uh, positions some politician or a celebrity as a joker, as a clown, as a criminal, as, as a whatever, or as a, as a villain like um, Darth Vader or uh, Voldemort from Harry Potter. Uh, these references to popular culture, it provides a kind of lubricant, a social lubricant, so that the meme is spread because it's knowable. But underneath that is probably some kind of social, cultural, or political critique. And it's that essence that can become remarkable. In other words, in order, like, literally remarkable, that you want or need <coughs> to remark some, to make a comment about it. That's where you talk about something getting to a point of being viral, where it's, hey, you have massive viral spread. It's, um, it's a possibility, at least. Um, and I would say, to, to conclude the response to the question about how long a, a dialogue about any issue can be generated through memes, 
Um, there are, of course, examples of this, and there probably will continue to be examples. Um, one of the other individuals writing on memes, uh, Lamore Schiffman, she came up with the concept of the hypermimetic spectacle. In other words, there are certain events in time, for example, the death of the queen uh, or anything. I mean, uh, it could be, uh, there are so many, it's hard to pick just one. Uh, during the Trump presidency, there was one pretty much every day. But th these moments in time where people meme about it, and it also begs the question, are we at the point where we are learning about current events initially through a meme? In fact, I learned about the Queen's death through a meme before I, I switched to BBC and I was like, oh my goodness, wow, it's true. So, um, but back to the point about getting the dialogue to, to be longer lasting, uh, you need to have an offline component. You need to have some aspect of meeting with other people uh, to make the movement become, if you're talking about a movement, like a, if you want to switch from dialogue to a movement, I don't know. But uh, if, it, if it needs to, uh, to accomplish real world impact, it has to be at least somewhat offline as well. Uh, this, this lesson that I've learned from my research, it's also, it's not also, it's, it's quite true among the far right extremist groups. And you see this on 4chan. Of course, 4chan is very, it's not very, it, it is entirely anonymous but there's an offline component joining a militia group um the QAnon conspiracy theory movement um all of that is an offline component to the online uh sort of hyper real experience uh the second question that i was given is do i think whether whether i think uh, social media platforms are being exploited in an era of fake news and fake content i mean Yes, of course, they're, they're being exploited, but let's think about who's exploiting whom. It's, of course, the responsibility of the social media platform, the owner, uh, that they leave. I mean, you probably know some of these stories already. There are some real, some, some quite a few tragic examples where content was left online. For example, Facebook is, is really quite... Um, has a really bad record on, on this. And I have no qualms, I have no problem pointing the finger at, uh, at Facebook. It's, it's, it's a quite um, attention-seeking, uh, obsessively attention-seeking platform. The, the, the idea is these platforms, the people behind them, the algorithms, they're very well aware of what content triggers you, be it a sexual content, be it um, violence, be it fear-based, be it... Um, uh, sadness, it triggers sadness or maybe anger, th they're going to stay up or they, they're, they're going to be allowed to be uh, to stay longer because they work so in, in such an incendiary, provocative way. It's not an accident. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the symptom of the quote unquote era of fake news and fake content. Uh, you have a surplus of information everywhere you look, through your phone, etc. cetera. Um, but how often do we stop and check whether this triggering story that might appeal to a certain aspect of my ideology, my religion, my background, etc., it, it might be more convenient, more attractive to simply view the video or share it and so on. I mean, very often, of course, as I'm sure you know, uh, links, for example, URLs that are shared on Twitter uh, are not previously linked or excuse me clicked by the by the user and if even if so they probably even haven't, haven't read the whole article but it's like that FOMO fear of missing out you don't want to miss out on this latest report or the, the the breaking news 24 7 aspect that you want to be a part of that experience that that online participatory culture experience and finally, uh, the question was, how do, how do I think original artworks can be documented and preserved across social media platforms? Now, I, I, I have an answer to this, um, but I would first say that I take the view that memes, uh, internet memes, are basically a new form of art or a new kind of digital art form. Um, I don't think it's right to say 
the, these memes qualify, but these don't. But to be perfectly honest, uh, it's more the image-based memes that I think would fall into this category, where there's a, a merging of popular culture figures. Um, one quick example that I would give you is uh, back in 2008, Obama was remixed as the Joker in, in different online circles, but also offline. And in 2016, Trump was also remixed as Joker. Now, we can debate whether Joker is a form of art, but it's from a comic book uh, uh, genre of literature, TV, film, etc. Its function in Jokerizing Obama and, and Jokerizing Trump were quite different. With Obama as black man in a white face as Joker, it becomes he's the black man, he's a threat, he's a possible thug. With Trump, it worked as a totally different messaging that Trump is uh, the chaos, uh, what is it called, drain the swamp, um, the outsider to get things done, that kind of the wild card, right? It, it works, even though it's ex the exact same image, but for two totally different messages or intentions. Now, I do think that memes are a form, a new, new, a new digital art form. And I say that because I see a conceptual, conceptual linkage between the socio, cultural, political memes that are critical and the early Dadaist movement that was in response to the First World War. Um, the Dadaists rejected the, the horrors of the, of the war and they saw that the war was an outcome of failed, um, very modernist institutions, thus prompting a very postmodern um, artistic reaction. I think in the same way, people are overwhelmed with reality. They, it's, it's too much all the time. There's always, always another crisis, always this. What do we do? We sit back and we share memes. Now, of course, this is a little simplified, but that's basically a kind of meta explanation for a lot of it. Uh, second part of the question or second part of my answer to the question whether original artworks can be documented and preserved across social media um i think that um my colleague here dr surav banerji uh, uh, answered this very well also with respect to the idea of um, nfts but i would say there are entire genres and subgenres and accounts on various platforms facebook being one of them in this example for something called the classical art meme or classic art memes. They take a classical work of art and remix it to make a comment about something happening politically, um, culturally, socially, whatever, maybe in the entertainment world or whatever. Um, and so you have two things happening at the same time, similar in a way to the Joker example with Trump and Obama, but not quite. You have older art, uh, image, whatever, maybe from the golden age, from, from the Dutch golden age or whatever, and it's remixed somehow for some relevant, resonant point of our modern condition. Um, and sometimes it might not even be remixed or edited. It might simply be someone's reaction in a, I don't know, some old, old um, painting from the 16th century, but the reaction m matches the mood or the, the expression, you know, like when you are rushing to the elevator and you 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 don't want the other person to enter you know there's that one meme of the guy who's like hmm you know and they can <laughs> they can match or fit the moment that one might feel or experience online um and that to to stop there and, and to break for uh that is also a good way of understanding what i was saying with the first uh question and answer about the the tremendous impact on our attention um, can't be overstated. Okay, that's that's um, all I wanted to share about that for now. Thank you for your attention and thank you TMYS for your invitation. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your brilliant insights uh, revolving around the discussions on uh, humor, memes, and social media, of course. Um, now we shall begin our question answer session. And I would like to ask my first question to Dr. Banerjee. So um, in one of his interviews, the celluloid genius uh, Riti Ghatto claimed that cinema seemed an ideal medium for him to convey whatever he felt about the reality around him. But if he found a better medium that could replace cinema, 
he would have chosen that platform any day. Uh, do you think social networking spaces too can be easily replaced? How do you envision artists exhibiting their artworks in the future? Okay, uh, so that's a very interesting question. But uh, the point is that uh, when you talk about people like Ritik Ghato, who is uh, himself an institution, and uh, somebody as mundane as me try to answer that question, it becomes difficult. Because how uh, people like us take social media and people like him would have taken social media. But there is no denying the point that uh, Ritik Ghato, even Rabindranath Tagore, they had, all, they had been ahead of their time. So it is very apt for him to say that if he found uh, another medium, he would have definitely gone for it. So it, it, it's experimenting. It's like uh, coming out of his comfort zone. So like you remember Rabindranath never used a synthesizer for his songs. And I remember an incident where a budding Rabindranath Sangeet artist was denied permission from Vishwamati uh, uh, in bringing out his cassette because he had used synthesizer. But I was very sure that if Rabindranath was living when synthesizer was invented or used, he would have used the synthesizer. The same with Rishi Bhattar. I mean, definitely, had he been alive, I mean, making films today, and had he found the medium of uh, social media and uh, OTT, if I'm uh, I'll be more specific, I, he would have gone for it, definitely. But then there is also a flip side to it. I, I am very sure that we have heard the names of uh, Hero Alam uh, and Bhimtak Puja. So I'm sorry, I'm becoming a bit local, but uh, Ashraful Hussain Alam and uh, Puja Jain. So uh, uh, Hero Alam is a Bangladeshi freelance music uh, video model and an actor on, active on social media. And he has about 2 million uh, FB followers and 1.5 million on YouTube, if I'm not wrong. And uh, Bhimtak Puja or Puja Jain is also an Indian YouTuber with 29 million uh, views for her 12 duty videos. Now, uh, I'm not criticizing them, but uh, let us be very honest, they are at best bad performers and bad artists who have become famous. So yes, if, if, if the social media is giving you, as Ritu Pondra had said that there's a flip side to it, as if social media has given the creative people to connect with the audience to kind of uh, make their art known to a lot of uh, people who would have otherwise had no access to the museums or other forms, uh, movies or other things. Then uh, the, the social media has also made such people uh, such people famous and almost stars. And I'm not naming, but you know that on TikToks and Reels, there are other people who do nothing, but I mean, uh, they upload obscene videos and they also have millions of followers. So although Rishi Ghatak was right in his saying that, uh, yes, uh, so he would have embraced social media had it been there. But uh, of course, uh, I am not uh, very, uh, what should I say, uh, willing to accept that Social media in the hands of everybody is a very safe medium and everybody should be experimenting with it. So that would be my response. Uh, thank you so much for your answer, sir. Ritupurna, you're mute. Ritupurna, you're mute. Sorry. Uh, you're still mute. mute. Oh, now can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so are we allowed to ask questions to our co panelists? Yes, sure, you can. So I, I had a question for Professor Wiggins. Uh, while talking of memes, you said that, you know, the element of humor is important. Even if you don't get that humor, it may not, something may not humorous to you, but somebody else. Do you think that then there is a, I was just wondering, is there a connection between uh, cartoons, especially political cartoons and memes? Are memes the modern day avatars of what a political cartoon would be in a, in a previous age, would do in a previous age in Europe? Yeah, there's a very, it's a good question. It comes up a lot, believe it or not. Um, there's an important distinction to make. On the surface, yes, they're very similar, of course. But the important thing is, who's the author? Mm -hmm. In other words, I, with regard to memes, I, I take the argument that one doesn't need to really worry about the author because it's who's sharing it. It's who's sharing the very racist, offensive meme. You know, the author might not really feel that way, but the people sharing it, that's more interesting and that requires far more research again i'm referring to my work with the far right groups and such um i work with them i mean the, looking at their stuff online but the political cartoon that is this probably decided discussed at an editorial team meeting someone's suggesting it proposing it it's gate you know it's it goes through the gatekeeping process in a way um possibly and also each cartoonist has his own stamp his signature style 
Right, right, exactly. Whereas memes, that's not so important. And you can just edit it out and people don't really care whose it is. It's it's more about the the assumption or something that you're part of a larger process of participation and, and, and meaning creation. Okay. Thank you. I also yep. had another question for everybody. And that includes Monjima also. I'm genuinely curious about this. So of all the social media platforms, which do you think is the most effective in terms of, for example, the work we are doing, where we need to, you know, uh, maximize uh, attention, we need to spread the word, which, which do you think is the most effective of all? Platforms? I'll take that on, I'll take that on behalf of uh, CMYS because I'm leading the series. <laughs> Let me lead from the front. So it, 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 it all depends if it's on a, what kind of target audience you have. So like uh, my daughter who is a teenager, uh, she swears by Insta. Mm -hmm. I am more of a Facebook person. Ah, yeah, so, I've uh, been told then, Facebook uh, is redundant, yes. but I don't find yes. it so. I don't find no, it No, because so. we, are belong to a certain, we belong to a certain age, we belong to a certain, uh, let's say. We are uh, old, uh, yes. Kind of, <laughs> I'm not saying that we are old, we are just, I mean, like, we have crossed that age when Insta came. So we were like all good people who migrated to uh, Facebook. But my uh, the people belonging to the teenage group, uh, Gen Z as they'd like to call themselves or whatever, I don't know. So they are more into Insta. And then you will find that the, the people which are targeting, uh, your target audience is the uh, more, what should I say, hot and happening people. Then you have to go on Twitter and tweet and tag them. So it all depends. I, I, there's no such one answer that uh, for our project or for our uh, the thing, kind of a platform, this is best and that is not so good. It all depends on what kind of uh, audience you're targeting. So I, I guess that will be the answer. Okay. Uh, Professor Wiggins, I would think? offer the following. Um, there's social media and there's social networking. So uh, I think his video is I think, frozen. Professor, uh, yeah, Dr. Bradley has frozen. So like, uh, Manjima, can you continue? Yes, sir. Sure. And yes, uh, I was actually thoroughly enjoying a uh, ah, beautiful conversation. Yes, sir. It's fine. No, okay. Sorry, I, I, I must have lost connection somehow. I would just offer the following yeah, yeah. social media and social networking um, site or social networking media, whatever. Uh, YouTube, I would say, first and foremost, we don't often think of it as social media, but it is that. Um, started out that way, at least. Quick example, during most normal times, in terms of the total usage of the internet um, before the pandemic, YouTube was about seven or eight percent. As of March, April 2020, whenever the pandemic really hit hard, it jumped to 16 percent. That's a lot of people watching conspiracy theory videos and, and just crazy stuff, right? On the other hand, I would say TikTok because it is... Um, it just blew up in terms of new membership throughout 2020, 2021, and now 2022. It's, it's, it's astonishing how, how I don't know if the massive adoption of it means that it's a better platform for persuasion or for messaging or whatever. But if you want to, um, if it's a more, a more strategic message, I don't, I would say a combination of platforms probably not just one, but, um, but yeah, so that's my, my contribution there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, yes, as I was saying that I was uh, being a part of this beautiful conversation, but uh, I think we are going to continue with our uh, question and answer session. My uh, second question is to Dr. Roy. Uh, Ma'am, how challenging has it been to memorialize uh, Bengal's partition history and its aftermath through the Kolkata Partition Museum project in the age of screens. The, you know, as I just said, uh, what should have been a challenge, we kind of worked around it during the pandemic because, you know, we faced it right, almost right from the beginning. We were forced into digital mode right from the beginning. So we strategized ourselves in a way where we could maximize it in the best way we could. I'm not saying that is the best. And I just want to offer an example, just as Professor Wiggins was saying that, you know, uh, these platforms are good in motivating people or arousing interest, but not maintaining, uh, you know, for sustaining interest, you also need offline things. And that is something I've seen so much in the past one year, including our own exhibition, 
So for example, while uh, you've had online exhibitions, you've had online events, so many things online, just from the very moment that people could have physical events, there was a hunger for it. And since I'm based in Kolkata and I mostly attend events in Kolkata, in the last one year, especially last couple of months, I have seen, I've been to exhibitions. I'll give you two examples. One was on Meera Mukherjee, the sculptor by Thakuthi Guho Thakup and all the Guho. They, uh, at Gallery 88, there was no standing space uh, on the day of the inauguration. Shahidul Alam burned but not seen Sheena Puri at Imami. To give just two examples. You know, like the very first day, it was kind of sold out. And I remember Inapuri saying that, you know, she just cannot, I mean, while everybody has done online things, she just cannot imagine artwork uh, not to be experienced uh, physically, you know. Uh, so there has been a tremendous hunger for uh, physical events. Uh, I somewhat don't like the word offline. Uh, because it means that we are prioritizing, you know, we are uh, in terms of this, we are, we are offering this binary of online and offline and offline is the opposite of online. So then you're making online existence or more the primary uh, discursive. Yeah, I, I don't like that. And the physical also doesn't sound very good enough, but still. And the other thing I would say is uh, obviously we want, uh, we want to do more physical events. And we are planning them as such. As I said, that April, August will continue uh, like we have we have done before. And with the virtual museum, it was your next question, but uh, it it is in relation to to this. If I can jump you and answer the third question as well. So with the VKPM, what we are trying to do is uh, see we want uh, we are still a few months away from completing the work. Like the what we have initially envisaged, obviously material will get keep get adding uh, but what the initial design and initial content uh, what we had uh, envisaged so that when we complete that work in a, in a few months time we actually want to focus on this a bit we want to see how it is being uh, you know what traction it is getting uh, with the public what are the challenges what we you know one of the chief challenges of the of working on vkpm was just not the you know we were an online team so we never met on the day of the launch, five of us met together, which was the maximum number, five out of 40. So we, uh, so virtual, uh, so the virtual museum was being worked upon by a virtual team. And I don't need to go, I mean, everybody knows the challenges of working virtually, you know. Uh, but one of the problems, I will not say problem, challenges was that though we had experts in the team, who were experts in their own specialized fields, we were all working for a virtual museum for the very first time. So we learned things as we went along, even now, like every month we come up with something that we have never imagined before, you know, because we just don't know what this process entails. So which is why once it is out there in the world, we want to give it some time to see how it, you know, how it is building up, how it's progressing, how people are responding to it. And we are hoping since this is a very unique project, it's the first virtual partition museum. Uh, we also, we are hoping that through this project, we'll be able to attract funding, funding enough to go big. Uh, because still now what has happened is we have had corporate sponsorship, uh, but it has been event based. But we need a general bigger fund for the project as a whole. Uh, and we are hoping that with BKPM, we'll be able to do that uh, is one thing. And we just want to continue doing uh, keeping this, you know, this, this, uh, you know, changing the discourse of partition is something we want to keep working at. And every year we do new things. Like last year we started, uh, you know, a, a concert. This year we uh, started, uh, we instituted a, a, an annual lecture series, which was hugely successful. Professor Shekhar Mandapatha, who's a very big name in partition studies, he gave his inaugural lecture at President's University, which was sold out. And much more than sold out, there was more than double the number of audience that day. Uh, and I just want to say, I, I want to add one thing. I think one thing that the pandemic has done, it is, you know, when people say this online mode, online existence, digital mode, actually it was a part of our lives. For, as a teacher, I know. So we have, we have been teaching in smart classrooms for quite a while now. You know, it's just that in the pandemic, it became the default mode during those two years. 
But I think the other thing that has happened is, and what I understand of it, is what the hybrid mode has become the, has become the norm now. So even when you're having physical events, people ask you, do you have a link? Uh, will it be shared? Will it be, can we join? So people automatically expect every event which is happening to be accessible to all, even when it is not the intention of the organizer. So I think the hybrid mode will, I think will gain currency even more. Uh, this is my understanding of it. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for your answer. And uh, before concluding today's panel, I would like to ask uh, a question to uh, Dr. Wiggins. So uh, in your article, the discursive power of memes in digital culture, ideology, semiotics, and intertextuality, you spoke about the exploration of culture, economy, and politics through the popularization of the meme culture. Uh, can you please elaborate it to our audience? Are you referring to the book, my book, Discursive Power? It's, it's this one. You're, well, could you repeat your question again? <coughs> so uh, it's like one of your articles um, titled The Discursive Power of Memes in Digital Culture, Ideology, yeah. Semiotics, and Intertextuality. Yeah. You spoke about the exploration of culture, economy, and politics through the popularization of the meme culture. So. Okay. Uh, would it be possible for you to elaborate it to our audience? Sure, sure. I mean, I the book handles uh, in different chapters uh, exactly these kinds of questions. For example, um, the chapter four is all about political memes, and it talks about like the example that I gave with regard to the uh, Obama as Joker, Trump as Joker. That's that's a, that was a very early example to show how uh, offline groups can remix remix uh, pol politicians with popular culture references to have some kind of other meaning for for their for their group uh, for the purpose of identity consolidation mostly but I also looked at um, among other countries the um, looked at Putin's Russia and this was of course well before the war in Ukraine and there was of course there were claims of interference in the US election 2016 but it was mostly the um, elect the, the memes that came out in response to Russia's 2018 election, where it was one example after the other of just basic political malaise. Um, one meme was it's all in Russian, but basically it, it was phrased as, uh, "Would you?" Sorry, let me think for a moment. Do you agree that Putin should be president? And it was it was the answer was only like any. Like, no, I do agree, or yes, I don't agree, something like that, where any answer basically means agreement. It was, I can't recall it right now, but it's just this, um, it's a malaise. It's a kind of people kind of give up. This is the way it is. There's no real future, you know, that kind of thing. In terms of the economic aspect, I looked in chapter five on how companies like Delta Airlines or uh, the fast food chain in the United States, Wendy's, and a lot of other examples uh, like vitamin water, uh, how they use memes. Gucci does this as well, or did this as well, 2017. Uh, a lot of other companies too. They'll consciously hire millennials to produce memes for them in the hopes of resonating with some audience that they think they've identified. Now, in the case of Gucci, in their hashtag um, TFW or that feeling when Gucci campaign, it actually worked. It increased their their brand their market share by um, almost a full percent. And any other previous campaign, it might sound like a little bit, but compared to their previous campaigns, it just didn't have that kind of increase. And it was run, I think, from March to December of 2017. And it was poking fun at itself, and yet that worked, even though it's a quite a luxury brand. So that's that's one quick example. And another, uh, I talked about what an audience is and what what identity is in terms of memes um, and then also in the, the final chapter was the the conceptual linkage between memes and art and um yeah i mean i i i hope this has answered your question i i, I don't know if i have answered it but please let me know thank you
Yes, sir. I, I requested you to elaborate and I think uh, with uh, such great examples, you, you actually uh, answered most of the question. Of course, uh, it, it would have been great if you continued, but uh, of course, uh, we overshot the time, I guess. And um, thank you for your answer, by the way. I think I uh, understood what you uh, meant to yes. say for this. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, Mojima, I just wanted to say something uh, which put into your second question, uh, which I kind of jumped, is whether, because this is important since we are working on the KPM, that whether it's chance or coincidence, uh, uh, choice or coincidence, uh, you know, it, uh, it uh, so the, the VKP is actually the brainchild of Aurobh Jyoti, the architect, the Indian architect based in the US, who, who contacted us. So he knew about our work, he had read about us, but he actually met me in an online event. And he, uh, as audience, where I was the speaker, uh, 1947 Partition Archive, and uh, an interview of mine, and he connected with me afterwards. So connection automatically does not really lead to collaboration, of course, but that was an important point. And there were several months of discussions, and then he, uh, you know, he gave us a presentation, and then we decided to go ahead with it. Uh, so the thing is, I just would like to say that, you know, his offer of a collaboration, I mean, he offered a dream on a platter, really. Uh, so we were thinking of trying to, we were, we wanted to, we were searching for an architect or in the near future, once the pandemic, you know, we came out of the pandemic in 2020, we didn't know when we would do that. So we would search for an architect, in, in this case, the architect came to us, which was a stroke of huge luck. Uh, it, he could not have approached us at a better time. You know, just when we were thinking, how do we proceed? How do we proceed with our work? Uh, you know, how best to uh, increase, to progress. And that is when he offered the idea of a virtual museum. And that was perfect for that time. Uh, so it gave us the opportunity to continue with our work. Uh, and content-wise, so the, the design, when it, when it gets... Uh, available you will see it's a very unique design he has done fantastic thing and, and that to be converted to reality uh i don't think we have the the means uh it's it's, it's huge it's mammoth his uh his design at, at a very big scale uh but as far as the content is concerned of course it is specific to the virtual museum but in terms of content we have progressed quite a bit there is there is possibility of reusing that uh, in a physical space if we if we want to. So in terms of content, we have progressed a little bit, and I think that was uh, the best thing we could do during the pandemic, really, apart from holding online events. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, your responses reflected how crucial these past two to three years have been, especially for your project, and we wish you all the best. Uh, Thank you. At Yes, ma'am. Uh, with this note, uh, we now come to the end of today's session. I would once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems. And for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. I extend a, a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Bradley A. Wiggins, Dr. Rituparna Roy, and Dr. Saurabh Banerjee for this wonderful and remarkable session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It Thank was you. Really